everybody. Um, I think Alara said a couple of minutes ago, but if you could make sure that you have your um, cameras turned off and your sound muted, and it will probably be easiest for you to view this if in the top right, you um, select the view button and select speaker view. And that's gonna make it so that the person talking is gonna show up in the center largest picture of your screen. Um, my name is Carrie Crone and I am one of the staff attorneys for the Court of Appeals. So we welcome you to our noon hour discussion and I'll be introducing my colleagues in a minute. I'm coming to you live from my basement in South Minneapolis over the Zoom technology. So we're hoping for smooth ride technology wise today and we've tested everything out, but if for some reason um, one of us gets lost, um, others will chime in and hopefully we'll continue to go forward. Um, so with that, I'll introduce my colleagues and colleagues, I ask you to both, I don't know, wave and, and give some hello or some greeting so that the speaker view will put you on and people can see your smiling faces. i start with um, Cindy Lair, who is our chief attorney for the Court of Appeals. Hi, everyone. And Matt Keating, who's a staff attorney colleague, works in family law primarily. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Mike Kunkel, who works on the criminal law side. Hello, everyone. And Jeff Simard, who is our appellate jurisdiction guru and handles a lot of things at the, at the front end of appeals. Oh. Jeff, I didn't see you on speaker view. Nope. <laughs> you have to say hello. Hello. Let's try this, try this again. Does that work? There you go. There, yeah. there you Thanks, are. Jeff. I was too and fast. I, I should have mentioned that I work on the civil and administrative side. So we're trying to give you sort of a variety of um, central staff to speak to today. Um, this is intended to be sort of a conversational CLE, and I guess I envisioned in, in non-COVID times that we would sit in front of the room and have a conversation and see how it, we moved through it. And I'm hoping we can replicate that as well as possible over Zoom. We've come up with a number of topics that we think are frequently um, inquired areas that, that we'll move through the discussion of, but we also encourage you to put questions in chat um, and we'll be monitoring that throughout the hour. Um, the caveat there is that we can't give legal advice, of course, um, and that we are not in the CLE format here to discuss specific cases. So if you have um, issues about specific cases, there's ways through the law library or the clerk of appellate courts or through um, other means that you can get assistance on specific cases. So by way, before I get into the questions and, and other people are going to talk, I promise you, um, I, in discussing the CLE, I think all of our best um, top of the line, non-legal advice to you is that you need to be consulting the rules. And I asked Elvira to distribute sort of a handout with a bunch of links on it to commonly used resources. And you'll see on there, there's five sets of rules that can potentially govern you when you're in um, practicing before the Court of Appeals. The obvious ones are the rules of civil appellate procedure and the rules of criminal procedure, Rule 28. Um, but you also may be governed by the public access rules, which I think are, you know, rel relatively less known set of rules, but they're going to govern who gets to see your filings when you make them in the Court of Appeals and other courts. And if you have something under seal in the district court and you want to maintain that at the Court of Appeals, how do you go about that? Or can you maintain um, confidentiality in the Court of Appeals? All of those things are in the public access rules, and I'm going to ask Cindy to touch on that later, but know that those rules exist. Um, we also have special rules for the Court of Appeals. We have a general set of special rules that talk about things like scheduling and oral and non-oral conferences and how things move through the court and can give you sort of what feels like inside information that you may not realize is publicly available in rules of procedure. There are also rules for family law appellate mediation. And depending on your practice area, you may or may not have those um, governing your appeal. 
but know that they're there. So, I mean, that's, that is our number one piece of advice time and time again, when we interact with practitioners is, did you look at this rule? So know that the rules are there. Know that the official version of the rules is on the Minnesota court, a judicial branch website, mincourts.gov. Um, if you are working with a West desk book, you risk that the rules are not up to date. You also risk, and this has happened to us from time to time, that West has a misprint. They didn't print a particular section of a rule or, and, and that's a little less common, but it has happened. So, and if you go on the website and you bookmark the rules, they are fully searchable in PDF or Word documents. They're super, super usable. So I encourage you to do that. I also encourage you to spend some time just tooling around the Judicial Branch website. There is a treasure trove of information on that website from self-help guides to the rules we discussed to standing orders on how many paper copies of briefs right now, none because of COVID, but in normal times, how many copies of briefs do I have to file? Um, Endless information. The clerk of the appellate courts has a landing page. Each of the courts has a landing page. So I encourage you to just spend some time on there and get to know what's there. And there are a number of the links on the handout also go to places on the judicial branch website. So with that, apologize for my long wind. Um, I want to move into the discussion. And I think we primarily are hoping to talk about appellate practice issues. Um, None, I think none of us are that crazy about talking about ourselves, but I know that there is some curiosity that sometimes arises as to what staff attorneys at the Court of Appeals do and how they fit in the role of the court. So I think we can start there and I'm gonna ask Mike to start that discussion for us. And then for this and all other questions, I would just ask my colleagues to weigh in as they have additional input and hopefully we can have a Zoom conversation. Mike? You carry. Um, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> well, we only got like 50 minutes left. Um, the court members of the court generally are going to operate as, as subject area generalists, um, having to have, you know, be able to handle everything in absolutely every area of Minnesota law, whereas uh, central staff is here to function as subject area specialists. Um, and part of that, as, um, as as Carrie once said to me, you know, central every case touches central staff on the way in and on the way out. Um, coming in, the, one of our first primary responsibilities is jurisdiction screening, making sure that this court has jurisdiction over the matter, um, that the that the the matter being appealed is is properly able to be appealed, um, working with any procedural deficiencies that exist. Um, also, especially on the criminal side, working with the court, the clerk of courts, clerk of appellate courts, uh, with self-represented litigants, um, and trying to keep those cases on track. Um, at the other end of that is, you know, when a case is nearing completion and an opinion is being drafted, each of us in our very, in each of us in our individual subject areas will review uh, those circulating opinions uh, and provide substantive guidance to the court on them um, before they finally head out the door. Um, in the middle of that, we in the middle of that we often assist clerks, uh, our law clerks, and the members of the court with substantive guidance on legal issues that may come up. Um, Another big part of our job is to assist the court with its special term calendar. Um, special term panels meet once a week and they essentially handle the court's motion motion calendars that uh, that usually procedural uh, motions filed by, by practitioners before we get to the substantive merits of a given case. Um, and we also once a year provide a great majority of the training to the incoming law clerks on how this all works. So that's kind of the kind of the dime tour of central staff. Anybody else have anything to add about that? Oh, I yes, think I, I left out one of the most important and exciting aspects, and that is some of us also serve on various rules committees. And so we can bring to the rules committees the perspective of the court and also the experience of the court. Is the court getting um, a lot of problems with attorneys not understanding a particular rule or a particular requirement? And obviously that it's helpful to have that kind of back and forth with the rules committees so that we can fix if there's a problem, if there's an ambiguity in the rules, it's helpful to be able to fix that. And we show up at CLEs and make presentations and also help the judges who of course do a lot of CLEs and, and make a lot of presentations. Well, anybody else have anything to add to that? I would say, you know, in addition that, you know, I think in the past CLE, we've maybe had a question about, you know, what's a typical day and I think there is 
not really a typical day. We serve at the pleasure of the bench and we have some regular duties that are pretty standard, but then also um, other things, you know, other duties as needed and as they arise. So that is what I would say about what we do and how we fit into that role. That kind of segues into a question of how is our role different now? I could take a moment to wish everybody a happy one year global pandemic. I don't know if that's a happy, but um, I, we just hit one year in this global pandemic. I don't think I knew what Zoom was a year and a month ago. Um, so Mike, if I can continue with you and others can definitely weigh in what, you know, how, how is, um, the pandemic been affecting the court's work? Especially kind of in, with the opportunity to look back over the past year, I'm, I would say we're all kind of pleased to say that it hasn't affected it that much. We have been fairly nimble in our ability to, to take our duties and, and, you know, and still accomplish everything we need to accomplish under, you know, circumstances, which for several months were very much in flux, and we didn't know how we were going to manage to do this. Now that the chaos has kind of settled down a bit, um, it is really, I think it has forced the court as been as well as many other institutions into, um, into a more technological environment than it, than it otherwise would have come into naturally. Um, I'd say one of the biggest changes um, is the lack of paper. Um, I, uh, the, 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 the carbon footprint of the judicial branch has, or, or of the Court of Appeals has been significantly decreased because we used to have, you know, parties filing multiple copies of multiple briefs and there were, you know, and when cases were done, there were bins filled with this. Um, circulating opinions we would read, you know, in hard copy. And it was, it was just, it was just part of the way the job was. And I can say that I have not printed a single piece of paper uh, in the past year. And there's been a lot of, and, and, you know, the, the court, as well as, as well as all the staff have found ways to adapt to that. And so um, it's, it's, I think it's, there's a significant benefit to that, that we've been able to start getting away from, you know, using, consuming so much paper. Another thing obviously is the advent of, you know, Zoom for, um, you know, oral arguments. There was, you know, there was a long period of time there where we were trying to figure out how to safely and securely, not safely, but securely, you know, have oral argument before the court. And now that that's kind of settled down, we have, we have this opportunity to, certainly a Zoom oral argument doesn't have the same gravitas as being in the courtroom. Um, but it also provides an unprecedented amount of access to the public for this, that there's no, there, it's not a question of how many seats are available. Anyone can see this from anywhere. Um, and so it, the access that it provides, um, you know, I, I think is a good counterbalance to anything that is lost by the fact that we're suddenly doing this over technology. And so it's, it's a very different environment than we were in a year ago. Um, but we have managed, I think, to find very effective um, and in some ways more beneficial ways of, of carrying out our jobs. Jeff, I got to move to you on pandemic because I, I, what do practitioners need to know about deadlines during the pandemic and how those have been affected? All right. Well, in May of last year, the Minnesota Supreme Court gave the Court of Appeals authority to grant extensions of deadlines established by court rule to initiate an appeal or request for review. However, that authority has been rescinded as of January 1st, 2021. So the Court of Appeals currently cannot extend a civil appeal deadline that is set by court rule. But the legislature separately suspended deadlines imposed by statutes governing proceedings in the district and appellate courts, including statutes of limitations and statutory appeal deadlines. The suspension of statutory deadlines applies to all statutory deadlines that had not expired as of March 13th, 2020. Those deadlines are suspended through April 15th of this year. Now, what does that mean? That means that the time to appeal could be dramatically different depending on whether your appeal deadline is set by court rule or set by statute. So just another reason why it's very important to look at the specific court rules or statutes for the you know, subject area of a case. And we included links to the rules, or excuse me, the orders that Jeff just referred from the Supreme Court and the session laws that affect those deadlines in the handout. So those are helpful to be aware of, I would say overall, and maybe I should have put this as my top tip 
number two at the beginning, just do it early. And then you don't have to worry about whether you're late. <laughs> so much of, uh, some of, you know, this kind of moves on to talking about how appeals proceed through the court. And I'm gonna ask Jeff to sort of stay on mic for this and talk about what happens after an appeal is filed. Well, as Mike pointed out, every appeal is screened for jurisdiction. If it looks like this court may not have jurisdiction over an appeal, the court will question jurisdiction and generally direct the parties to file informal memos. After the parties file informal memos, a special term panel of the court will generally either accept jurisdiction or dismiss part or all of the appeal. And when we're talking about jurisdiction, you know, they can be broken down into two main parts, appealability and timeliness. Appealability is fairly straightforward. Basically, you know, is the decision appealed properly before the court? And it, again, a good general rule of thumb is check the court rules and the statute specific to the subject area of the case first. Then check the rules of civil appellate procedure. It's also worth asking, has there been a final judgment? The appeal should be taken from a final judgment, if any. If there has not been a final judgment, it's good to look at, you know, is the appeal taken from an order appealable under Men Rule Civil Appellate Procedure 10303? Non-final orders are appealable in a limited set of circumstances. One common appealability issue we see is that a party appeals an order for the recovery of money. For example, an order requiring a party to pay attorney fees or expenses involving the party's children. But the problem is that an order for the recovery of money is not appealable, so you need a judgment. And this kind of makes sense because you need a judge a money judgment to execute on and if you don't have a judgment that's not appealable so that's something to watch out for another thing to watch out for is this court has a general policy against piecemeal appeals so you should check to see whether the district court's order has resolved all of the issues especially in family law cases where parties often file numerous motions and the district court may decide some of the motions and then reserve others this court generally doesn't like to have multiple appeals in the same case if it can avoid it. So if the district court's order has not resolved all the issues, the court may dismiss the appeal as non-final. Timeliness, when we talk about timeliness, we're talking about the time limit to file and serve appeal, you know, file and serve appeal initiating documents. That's generally the notice of appeal, the certiorari petition and writ of certiorari. Again, a good rule of thumb is to check the rules and statute specific to that type of case and then check the more general rules of civil appellate procedure. Time limit for a standard civil appeal is generally 60 days from entry of judgment or 60 days after service by any party of written notice of filing the order appealed. However, you should always check to make sure that a shorter deadline does not apply. Some of the deadlines are significantly shorter and may be triggered by different events than the events that trigger the deadlines in the rules of civil health procedure. For example, there are 20 day deadline for a juvenile protection appeal and a 15 day, day deadline for an eviction appeal. I want to say a few words about the uh, statement of the case, because that also is relevant to jurisdictional screening. The court generally uses a statement of the case to evaluate whether it has jurisdiction over appeal and whether all filing requirements have been satisfied. Providing information about why this court has jurisdiction over appeal in the statement of the case is thus very helpful. An extended argument on the merits in the statement of the case is generally not needed. You can save that for the brief, really. We don't need to have a very long, in-depth discussion of why you think what the district court did was wrong. Uh, you'll have plenty of opportunities to do that, but the statement of the case is not necessarily the place for that. The court also uses a statement of case to determine whether transcripts will be ordered and whether the case will be scheduled for oral argument. So it's helpful to have information, clear information in the statement of the case specifying if transcripts are necessary, if you've ordered the transcripts, if they've already been delivered, and if sometimes you know, even if you can say what transcripts of what hearings you're planning on order, plan ordering, that's very helpful to us. One note for respondents, if you think this, if you think the court does not have jurisdiction over the appeal, that is definitely something worth mentioning in your statement of the case. And a reason oh. to file a statement of the case, right? Because right. you don't necessarily have to file one as a respondent. Yes, that's a reason to file a statement of the case, definitely. 
But that being said, you know, you should, I would encourage you to raise those jurisdiction issues in your statement of the case as a respondent. But the most effective way to raise a jurisdictional issue as a respondent is by filing a motion to dismiss. You know, there are a couple of reasons for that. And one is it brings the jurisdictional issue directly to the court's attention. And another is that the court will have to consider and rule on the motion. You know, you may allude to a jurisdictional issue in respondent statement of the case, but it's possible that we won't pick up on that immediately. And so you may be better off just filing a motion to dismiss if you really think the court doesn't have jurisdiction. Another advantage of filing a motion to dismiss is the court has a preference to deal with jurisdiction issues on the front end rather than in the final opinion. So we like to be able to, if we don't have jurisdiction, we don't wanna be dealing with the case anymore. We want it to get dismissed. So it's helpful as a respondent, if you file a motion to dismiss, if you think the court doesn't have jurisdiction, especially filing a motion to dismiss before briefing has started. So we don't put a lot of resources into a case that maybe shouldn't be properly before us to begin with. So much good information right there. Um, I also, I guess I would add to that, that it just segues back into don't wait until the end of your deadline, because when you file something and if you have a deficiency, you're going to get a notice of filing from the clerk's office that tells you we need this from you before your appeal can go forward. It might be something that is jurisdictional. It might not. But for the jurisdictional things, if they're not done on time, we can't help you and or the court can't help you. Um, and then you also will get sometimes an order questioning jurisdiction that Jeff was just talking about. And if it's something that is fatal to your appeal, but you have time to file a new one and do it the right way, that's why you wanna be working earlier in these deadlines. I was in private practice. I never met a deadline I didn't like to sidle right up to and see if I could move past it a little. So I understand this is this is the struggle and, and that you all know this and, and yet I'm preaching it still, but it really, there is no pleasure from anyone in central staff or any of the judges and saying your appeal is one day late and we can't take it. So. Right. And one problem that can you know, happen is you file something right up against the deadline and then the clerk's office rejects it on Monday. You know, you file right up against deadline on Friday or something and then the clerk's office rejects it on Monday. Well, you don't have time. You didn't have time to fix it on Friday because by the time you had filed it, you know, it was like 11.59 p.m. So the clerk's office, of course, was not open. So that's another reason why it's helpful to file things, even just earlier in the day, you know, even if it's the day, you know, the last day, you're early in the day, because it may just simply be, oh, you didn't sign this document or you didn't file proof of service or something, which is could be very easy to correct, but you know, if it's too late, it's too late. And unfortunately, if it's a jurisdictional issue, we do not have very much flexibility on that. If any, yeah. Right. Does anybody else have anything to add on what happens to an appeal? Mike, I don't know, from a criminal perspective, when, when appeals come in the door, what happens to them or? Generally speaking, it's it's fair, unlike a, unlike a civil case that, you know, can have all, you know, sorts of questions about when you know when judgment has been entered and you know what orders are appealable it's generally pretty straightforward and criminal um you know you're usually appealing from the judgment you know when that occurs because it occurred on sentencing so tech typically we don't have uh, a great deal of uh, jurisdictional jurisdictional questions in criminal appeals um i would say one of the bigger one of the bigger things that we do encounter is um is again self-represented litigants um unlike the civil rules which which have deadlines that are hard and fast the deadlines in criminal um tend to be less draconianly enforced. Do have um, deadlines in criminal? They, I mean, they're, they're so, they're <laughs> kidding. Deadlines. Suggestions. Um, suggestions. <laughs> you know, one that's, of the, that's a running joke among the civil and the criminal side. <laughs> yeah. One of the very few hard and fast deadlines and one of the very few jurisdictional requirements besides a notice of appeal, um, it comes up as in state pretrial appeals in criminal cases where there, where service has to be made on the state public defender's office. That is one of, you know, and it's really, those are the times where there's, there's an absolutely, you know, do not pass go deadline. Um, more often than not, we're, you know, if something is late, there's especially from self-represented litigants or or litigants who who are represented by 
counsel but are incarcerated, um, that there may be there may be a reason why that notice of appeal hasn't been filed on time. Um, and particularly with self-represented litigants, we we make an effort not to we make an effort not to just slam the door on them if something if if there's something that that can be done because right. a major goal of the branch is to provide access and we wouldn't be carrying that out if we you know if something is handwritten coming from a correctional facility and we're just saying ah we didn't say Simon says you know you you didn't you know you didn't include uh, proof of service so we're just going to throw it out we we try to make opportunities for those litigants to to correct those deficiencies um, and so that's that's where. I would say the jurisdictional part of central staff on the, on the criminal side comes in is, is working with those parties under those non-ideal circumstances. And in this past year, um, it's been even more complicated with, um, with correctional facilities being locked down because of COVID and, um, and, you know, indigent self-represented litigants not having access to even sometimes to the mail, uh, much less the law library or materials to prepare these things. So that's been a, that's been a challenge on our end. I, I, I got, got, oh. Yeah, Jeff, go. I was just saying, I got a question. Are we, do we want to deal with those as we get them or at the end? Yeah, no, please do. So, the, so it's a uh, question is any comments on rule 5402 judgments on multiple claims improvidently granted on appeals from final judgments? It, it comes up in federal courts regarding jurisdictional challenges. That is no jurisdiction because the appeal should have been taken earlier. I guess what I could you know, comment on, I can't really count, comment on you know, federal practice, but what I can comment on is what we see, and that's, you know, 5402 allows you to, allows the district court to certify a final partial judgment. And there are some situations where that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's one party has a claim, they're out of the case now. None of the claims for the other parties really have much to do with that claim. So it makes sense for us to go ahead with that know an appeal on that one but you know a few words of caution about that first 5402 has specific language that needs to be in the order certifying the judgment so it needs to direct entry of judgment and said you know that and specify that you know, there's why no delay essentially is is necessary why we should enter this final judgment right away. But even if the district court has that magic language, it's still very helpful for the district court to explain why. Because if the district court doesn't explain why, and we have a partial judgment being appealed, the court may say, well, yeah, you certified it, but we don't think that was proper use of your authority. So we're going to dismiss it as, as premature, essentially. So. I think it's helpful you know, for a practitioner, if you want a final partial judgment, you should ask the district court for that. And it's helpful to have reason, you know, specific reasons why, because that is an extraordinary situation. Most of the time you wanna wait until all the claims have been decided before uh, entering a final judgment and appealing that. And how do we review that, Jeff? Because I know we've had some cases where district court has certified it and this court or the Supreme Court has said, no, you really shouldn't have certified that. So how, I mean, is that an abuse of discretion or is that, how do we look at those? The standard is abuse of discretion. How that's typically reviewed is you would question jurisdiction on that. And then that would be presented to the special term panel because if the district court does not act within its discretion and certifying a final partial judgment, then that means that there is no final judgment. Essentially, that turns the final partial judgment into just a partial judgment, which is generally not appealable. Okay. Absent any other questions or comments on that, I think we can move on and talk about motion practice and, and maybe even extraordinary writs and petitions for discretionary review. We maybe can mix that all together. I said I would kind of take uh, start on talking about motions, and I would, of course, refer you to the rules, Rule 127 of the Civil Appellate Procedure rules. Um, any request for something that you want from the court needs to be made by motion. And 
common motions include well, a lot of motions for extension. So refer back to do it early. But um, we also get motions about the record, motions, as Jeff said, to dismiss or about jurisdiction. Stay motions that can either be please stay this appeal or please stay the underlying proceedings while you're deciding this appeal. Um, so with regard to motions, I guess I would say, well, first of all, this is, this is kind of a formal, informal thing, but you don't need a separate document entitled motion or notice of motion. There's no time for you to notice that you're going to come and argue your motion. So really you can file one document that is your motion. You don't need a separate memorandum, but do consider whether you need affidavits. The rule provides that motions and particularly motions for extension of time, I think it's specifically referenced that you will provide affidavits to support your request. So if you are making factual assertions in a motion, those things need to be in a sworn affidavit or declaration. Um, and think, you know, consider whether there is stuff that needs to be provided to this court in order for us to evaluate, in order for the court to evaluate your motion. That is much less than it used to be because we now have this electronic filing and we have access to the district court file. So don't think that you need to give us all the pieces of the district court file. But if you're moving to dismiss because of mootness, there could very well be documents that are not in the district court file that you need to provide to this court in order for it to rule. If you are trying to add documents to the record, it's very helpful for you to provide the documents that you want to add. That is going to be an unusual case probably where that's granted. I'm not saying do, do make those motions, but in the cases where there is an appropriate basis to make such a motion, it's helpful to have those documents provided so that it can be evaluated whether they should have been part of the record all along or whether there's a basis to supplement the record. And if, if it's okay for me to butt in here, uh, please remember, I wanted a if, conversation. If it's a, you know, we do have access to district court record, but if it's an administrative appeal and the record has not been transmitted to us, we don't have anything except yes. for what the parties give us. Mm -hmm. So if you are filing a motion to dismiss and the relator hasn't filed, you know, situation where they haven't even filed a decision being appealed, we don't have much to work off of. So it's very helpful if you are representing an agency to provide you know, the relevant documents from the record with like a motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a very good point. Um, anybody else have anything they wanna ask or add about? Yeah, Cindy. Um, I would say there's essentially, there's two different ways that motions are handled. And um, thinking back to paper days, we used to refer to them as hand carried orders and special term matters. Obviously, we're not hand carrying anything anymore and we're not printing out the orders. Everything is being handled and routed electronically. But basically, routine processing matters, whether it's an order questioning jurisdiction, whether it's an order um, directing somebody to remedy a deficiency in their filings, maybe they didn't give us the affidavit of service, maybe we're missing the last page of the order, whatever it is. Um, it, those kinds of orders are handled on an ongoing basis, on a daily basis. Typically, the chief judge signs those. A panel of three judges is not convened to consider those kinds of routine processing matters. If the chief judge is not available on a particular day because she's speaking at a CLE, for instance, then there will be another judge that's designated as the signing judge that day. So those kind of routine matters are handled basically pursuant to court policy or procedures and they're not really going they're unlikely to be dispositive of a case and they don't tend to be as meaty the matters that go to special term um, you know mike referred to the weekly special term panel that is a panel of three judges again the chief judge typically sits and presides over that panel to have some continuity but then every week two different judges are assigned to that panel the special term panel will deal with more sometimes substantive versus procedural is kind of a hard dichotomy to even explain but they will deal with more substantive matters that is they'll deal with petitions for discretionary review petitions for prohibition and mandamus something that's likely to result in dis could result in dismissal of an appeal or acceptance of an appeal like a jurisdiction question that is contested sometimes after 
uh, the order questioning jurisdiction goes out, the parties figure out what their problem is and they fix it or they explain it or they explain why the impression we had is not accurate. So certainly there are times that the court will question jurisdiction and the answer is, oh, never mind. You, you used the wrong term, but no, you do have the appealable thing and your appeal is timely as to that. So sometimes they aren't heavily contested. In fact, sometimes when a jurisdiction question goes out, uh, the party that appealed, whether it's the appellant in a regular notice of appeal case or the relator in a certiorari, realizes that, oh, we're right. That is, they need to voluntarily dismiss because their appeal is premature and something more needs to happen in the district court. So that they do that and then they correct it and it doesn't end up having to go to special terms. So that sometimes happens too. But the other matters that go to special term you know, tend to be the petitions and the matters that are potentially dispositive of the case. So if the court is considering dismissal of it, it's more likely that it would go, go to special term. So the, uh, and I guess the other thing I want to mention, although, although Carrie started with it, so she opened with this, but I want to circle right back to it. And that is, if you're asking for an order or other relief from the court, you need to make a motion. I am surprised at how often attorneys write a letter to the clerk of the appellate courts and expect the clerk of the appellate courts to do things in their case. For instance, um, I'm scheduled for oral argument on such and so date. I'm going to be unavailable the month of May. Uh, no, I didn't bother to tell you, but would you please reschedule this? No, there's no way the court would let the clerk of the appellate courts reschedule cases. The court is in control of its calendar, and that requires a formal motion and a showing of an emergency that was unforeseen and an explanation as to why the notice wasn't given because you were just diagnosed with COVID yesterday. Okay, that's an emergency. Because I've got a you know vacation planned two months from now, that's not an emergency. You are required to give the court advance notice. But we've had a number of times when a letter has gone to the clerk's office, basically expecting the clerk to change something that the court issued by order or that the court has already, has already scheduled. And that's not sufficient. So I'm going right back to where you started, Carrie. If you want the court to issue an order or change something, you're going to need to make a formal motion, not just a letter to the clerk's office. So I don't know if that if that's a difference between district court practice and appellate practice that the clerk can take care of more scheduling matters because obviously you have scheduling clerks and motions clerks in the district courts, but that's not the way it works on appeal. So a formal motion would definitely be required. Well, as long as you uttered the word emergency, Cindy, I'm going to bat it back to you because <laughs> I, I think folks are interested in knowing, you know, if I have an emergency and I think, A, what is an emergency and what is not an emergency and, and B, in, event, in cases of true emergencies on motions or petitions or appeals, what's the process for that? Sure. Uh, the good news is on your e-filing portal, on appeal when you are e-filing using Emacs and you're asking for expedited processing of a particular submission and e-filing, there is a place for you to check a box, expedited consideration requested. That doesn't mean it's guaranteed. That just means you can request it. And then there's a place that you have to explain why you're requesting expedited handling. Because I didn't get around to filing the motion until the day before my brief was due is probably not a compelling reason for emergency handling. But because I just got diagnosed with COVID yesterday and my brief deadline is a week from now, that's a perfectly legitimate reason to be asking for expedited treatment. So the first thing is, yes, on your e-filing submission, one of your options is to choose expedited handling requested. You will be prompted to give an explanation for why you're requesting expedited handling, but you do have an ability to communicate with the clerk of the appellate courts about the processing and the prioritization of e-filings that are sitting in the queue. You don't need a separate motion there to expedite the handling by the clerk's office. So you, you will be able to do that on your Emacs portal in the first place. Going beyond that in terms of other kinds of emergency relief, 
the rules regarding um, your brief deadline, if you're seeking an extension of your brief deadline, do say that you have to file your motion before your brief is overdue. So it has to be within the time period before your deadline. So it doesn't say it has to be 10 days before your deadline or, or anything. The good news is we sometimes get calls from attorneys, for instance, on brief extensions, which more typically Jeff would end up handling. But when we get brief extension motions in, sometimes the clerk's office then will get calls from the attorney saying, I e-filed this two hours ago, there's no ruling on it. Well, okay, the fact that e-filing is available doesn't necessarily mean the court is going that A, the clerk's office is going to dock at everything the second it comes in, or B, that the court is necessarily going to rule on it the second it comes in. Some, I might say that might that could be one of the disadvantages of an electronic environment, as people, as soon as they've hit the send button or the submit button in Emacs, Emacs you know, they think, okay, that's it. Now I should get a ruling on it. Well, no, I mean, the clerk's office still has to be open. They still have to process it. They still have to get through the other things that came in overnight and the like. But the good news is if you file your motion for a briefing extension, you don't legitimately, you don't have to worry. The court's going to deny my extension motion and then dismiss because I didn't file my brief that day. That's not going to happen. So the good news is, you can take a breath and then wait, because even if the court doesn't give you the extension you asked for, no, you don't get three months. You guess you may get 10 days. The court will issue an order. They'll try to issue it before too much time goes by, and they will try to give you some amount of time rather than dismissing it because you've missed your deadline. So that's one kind of, you know, quote, emergency. It's not really an emergency but yes, the court will handle it on a faster basis. Sometimes the court, um, when you, after you've requested it, sometimes the court, typically the court will wait the response time, which on a typical motion is five business days. I just wanna highlight that because the rules have changed. The way that you compute time under the rules has changed recently. And if you're still relying on a 2019 desk book from West, that's not going to show up. So you're going to get your all of your deadlines wrong. So you make sure that you're looking at the website, as Carrie mentioned, and as the links are in the, the handout. But typically, we'll wait for the response time on most motions. But there are times when it's important not to have a lot of additional delay. So um, for example, we have an expedited commitment appeal. The brief is due on Friday. The attorney miscalculates and submits it on Monday along with a motion to accept the late brief. But, you know, the clerk's office rejects it because it's untimely. The attorney turns around and resubmits and says, please accept. So files a separate motion to accept the late brief. In that case, it's extremely unlikely that the court is going to wait five full business days for a response. Why? Well, number one, probably the committing authority or petitioner isn't going to respond because it's not typically a contested motion. B, it's an expedited appeal and the respondent's brief is going to be due soon and they need to know whether we're going to accept the appellant's brief. And so the bottom line is the court most of the time will wait the response time to expire, but there are some cases where it will not. And then the last area of an emergency basically would be petitions for prohibition and mandamus that are brought on an emergency basis. Rule 121 says that if basically a written petition can't be submitted, that it is possible for a petitioner to contact the chief attorney. It actually says that in the rules, so yes, like, neon arrow points this direction, I can't help it. Um, and But the first question in, in those situations is always, is this truly an emergency? Why can't you submit a written petition? There is an overwhelming preference by the court to have a written petition and allow the other time other side ample time to respond. So sometimes at most, the court might even consider a temporary stay of some sort just to give the parties time to file a written petition. So rule 121 does say in an emergency that you can contact the chief attorney to seek prohibition or mandamus. It is not very often granted. Typically, instead, the court will direct the parties to file a written petition and allow the response time to run. 
And then I think Carrie mentioned petition for discretionary review. That's not really any different. Those also go to special term and there's very specific rules on when you have to bring it within 30 days of the order you're challenging, the response time and so on. And then it goes to special term and there are very specific criteria that are considered in deciding whether to grant discretionary review. I would just say don't encourage your clients to be seeking discretionary review. Maybe the court grants one or two of those a year. It is not common. So that is not a high percentage play. The idea is if your order is not appealable as a matter of right, there's probably a good reason. And probably the court will make you wait until you have a final judgment and can appeal from that final judgment as a matter of right. Can I circle back to a minute for to expedited treatment? Because I think sometimes that expedited treatment checkbox and max gives a false sense of what you've done by checking that box. Um, and it will, you know, it will get the clerk's attention. It will get it to central staff. But I mean, if you've got something that you need expedited treatment on that's going to happen before the response period expires, you also need to bring a motion to expedite. Is that right, Cindy? Right, that's true. If you are really trying to shorten the other side's time to respond, you will need to be more proactive. And you can't just bury that request for expedited treatment, for instance, in the motion itself, because in all honesty, we aren't necessarily going to read your motion until the response time has passed. I mean, we may glance at it to see, to screen it, to see when will this likely be ready to go to special term, or is this the type of a matter that should be handled with a, as I said, hand carried order, but you know, basically on a, a single judge order. Uh, and I guess I, I probably skipped over one other thing, and that is there is a small category of motions that instead of going to the signing or the chief judge on a daily basis or to special term, there's a small category of motions that actually goes to a merits panel. Um, and, I'm, and I suppose I probably should have mentioned that there's, in a sense, there's three tracks as opposed to just two tracks for handling motions. So um, if a motion, Carrie mentioned, for instance, a motion regarding the record, well, let's say an appellant has included something in their addendum or in their brief and the respondent feels that that item is not part of the record on appeal, the respondent may make a motion to strike certain references or documents from the appellant's brief. Typically that's the kind of motion that isn't going to be handled at special term or by the signing judge of the day. It will instead be deferred to the merits panel because really what you're saying is when they look at the record, they will then be able to evaluate whether this thing is properly within or outside of the record. Uh, a motion for additional time at oral argument. We have a high profile environmental case that's coming up. It has many parties and many amicus. Normally amici are not allowed to participate in oral argument, but because there are many parties involved, all of whom filed separate briefs, the question is how to divide that time at oral argument. Well, again, the merits panel is in the best position to evaluate that because they're going to have the briefs in front of them. And after all, they're the ones who are going to have the questions to ask at oral argument. So we want to get their input. So that those, those are two typical motions that would go to the merits panel. After the case is decided, uh, a motion for attorney fees, for instance, would also go to the merits panel. So there are a few, that's kind of a third track, and I'm sorry, I sort of skipped that. But yes, if you're asking for expedited handling, you would want to make your, you know, separate motion for whatever it is you're asking, petition for discretion review, petition for prohibition, whatever, and you would want to clearly and separately make a motion to shorten the respondent's time and to, for expedited consideration. Thank you. Um, I can't believe we are at 10 minutes of one already. So I guess briefly, Cindy, I also had wanted to ask, and maybe there's a highlight from public access that, that we can put out there to bring awareness to that. But I also want to ask Matt about briefs and oral arguments. So mm -hmm. have at, is there, you know, I guess I come from the old school. When I was in private practice, if we wanted something under seal, we put it in an envelope, we sent it to the court and we said, this is under seal. And the court didn't necessarily even say, well, what's in it? They were like, parties agree, this is under seal. That's not the practice anymore. And so I'm always yep. encouraging you to talk about that and, and sort of where we're at on public access. 
and I think the the main the place to start is under the access rules and there's a link in the handout a lot of people don't even read the access rules and I'm sorry they are a little dense so you it you have to be committed when you're going to read through the access rules. But the place to start is rule two. The presumption is that all court records are presumed to be public unless, and you go to rule four for the specific exceptions. So for instance, um, judicial work product, even if there's that's still not going to be accessible to the public. Medical records, identifying information about a minor who is a victim of a criminal or a juvenile delinquency act. Those are examples and things that are made inaccessible by a court order. But those court orders have to have very specific findings in them. And it's only if that that only makes that particular document inaccessible. What people also overlook is rule four, subdivision four, which says even if a particular document like a medical record is not accessible to the public, the parties and the court may refer to the contents to the extent necessary and relevant to the particular issue being addressed. So the medical record itself may remain inaccessible, but the diagnosis, the symptoms, the uh, treatment may be essential to the court explaining the basis for its decision or for the parties to argue. The appellate rules, you also have to look at the appellate rules. As Carrie said, often there's more than one set of rules that applies. In the appellate rules, you're basically looking at rule 112. 11201 subdivision one says if the document, if the document was inaccessible to the public in the district court, it remained, it, the document, remains inaccessible on appeal. So then the rules 11202 says, if you are giving us the document, you have to segregate that in a separate confidential addendum. As you can tell from what I'm emphasizing, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden your brief, because it talks about something that is sensitive, becomes not public. That's not true. Your brief on appeal is public. The fact that you have a dispute with a family member is public. The allegations, the arguments you are making on appeal, that is public. Under some very unusual circumstances, the court may authorize two versions of briefs and maybe that will bring us to the briefs thing that Matt was gonna talk about. If you are interested in some, seeing some of this, on PMAX, which is the court's docketing system that's free and available to the public, for instance, there were two sets of briefs authorized in one of the Prince estate cases. The file number is A19-0503. And just recently in the Polaris case, which was just argued before the Minnesota Supreme Court, A20-0427. In those cases, the, the Supreme Court was asked in the Polaris case to close the oral argument to the public and to and do not live stream it in order to protect the attorney client privilege that is asserted in that case that is the subject of the case. And the Supreme Court said in an order that I think is really worth people reading, no, court proceedings are public. You just make sure you don't quote from that particular document. You refer the court to the particular page number of the document because you've got an obligation not to disclose that in open court, but no, we're not going to shut down the oral argument. But the briefs, they did allow two sets of briefs with limited redactions. So only the strictly confidential information could be redacted from the set that was accessible to the public, not page after page, just a line here and a line there. So that's my brief transition to Matt, since I know Matt was going to talk a little bit about briefs. So Matt, turning turning to briefs and oral argument, I'm wondering what advice you have for practitioners and maybe, you know, talk up the standards of review, which we've also linked in the handout. Fair enough. Um, I'll start real quickly with oral arguments. Um, <clears throat> I would, I, I've seen oral arguments where a question will come from the bench and you can see counsel double clutch at the podium trying to figure out where that question came from. I would strongly recommend that if that happens to you, just answer the question as it is asked because the judge may be looking at something about 
a circulating opinion and they're trying to fit your appeal in with theirs, or there may have been some type of pre-conferencing in the case and the judge is trying to talk with another member of the panel through counsel, or there may be a question as to how it fits in with something that's currently pending in the Supreme Court or any number of other things. They may be trying to frame a question that they're gonna ask the respondent later on. So just answer the questions as they are asked. If after you've done that, you figure you need to um, clarify or put some context on the answer, go ahead and do that. But I would strongly encourage you to answer the question as it is asked by the bench, even if it catches you somewhat flat-footed. With respect to briefing um, and making arguments generally, whether they're oral or written to the court, I think it's very important to remember that the Court of Appeals is an error correcting body. And <clears throat> excuse me, as a result, what we do is we identify errors and then to the extent that we're able to, we correct them. We don't reweigh evidence and we don't make credibility determinations and that type of thing. Um, additionally, the case law is uh, overwhelmingly and unambiguously clear that error is not presumed, at least in civil cases, it's not presumed on appeal, which means that the burden is on the appellant to show an error. And in addition to showing an error, uh, Rule 61 in the case law is real clear that harmless error is not sufficient to get relief on appeal. So you're in a world where you have to show both error and prejudice. And there is a case law that also indicates um, or exemplifies, if you will, the old maxim, uh, de minimis non curat lex, the law doesn't concern itself with trifles. So in addition to showing error and prejudice, if you're looking to get relief on appeal, you have to show that the prejudice is not de minimis. You've got to show that there's some actual substantive significant prejudice. And when you're looking at whether there is an error, when you're trying to show that there's an error or if you're the respondent that there isn't an error, you want to make that showing or attempt to make that showing through the lens, if you will, or through the prism of the standard of review for the question that's in play with respect to that particular error. In other words, if it's a fact question, you're looking for whether or not the district court's factual determination is clearly erroneous. And if it's a legal determination, the appellate courts are gonna review that de novo. If it's a discretionary question, then we're in a world where, you know, you'd be looking to show an abuse of discretion. The standards of review for a significant number of questions are uh, linked in the handout that, that uh, was sent out and I would encourage you to look at that. That's something that the court and the court staff um, use very, very frequently. And um, if you have a question as to what the standard of review is for your uh, particular question uh, on appeal, you know, see whether it's there. Uh, it may have an answer. If it doesn't have an answer, it may give you, if not a roadmap, at least a compass and a jackknife to finding the appropriate standard of review for the question that's in play on appeal. Another point that I'd make with respect to the appellant's burden to show error is that that particular burden includes the burden of providing the appellate court with a record that shows the error that's being alleged. So the appellant is looking to uh, provide a transcript if that's necessary or anything else that's, that's necessary. And if the appellant is not sure whether something is in the record, they should probably verify that uh, before the appeal is filed if they have any questions or if they can't do it before the appeal is filed, they may end up having to make a motion to supplement the record, which is a very dicey business. Um, and because that burden is on the appellant, if there isn't a record, uh, that if the record isn't what the appellant thought it was, the result is that uh, falls against the appellant and makes it very problematic to prevail on that particular question on appeal. I see that we're almost out of time here. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Carrie. Thank you for your attention. We're almost pumpkins. Well, this, I mean, this has been a fast hour and we tried to touch down in a lot of areas, maybe, maybe too many areas, but wanted to share with you some of our insights. Um, so I, we thank you for being here. And I guess Elvira, I'm not sure how we wrap it up. 
however you would like to. <laughs> <laughs> I will um, be posting this handout actually on our website. I, I did put it in the chat several times so that people that logged in later could get to it. But just know, look for later today an email from me to everyone who was registered. I'll be sending a follow up out. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. I just have a question for, for one of you. Did, was there an agreement to have this recorded or not? I don't believe it was discussed. It wasn't discussed. I noticed the icon indicating it was being recorded. Yeah, and I can delete it later if you don't want it, or I can post the recording so that people who might have missed something and want to follow up can do that. We'll I don't have any objection. Okay. I don't have any objection. Okay. Um, All right.